Good morning. Just what you needed, some bald guy to talk to you about aging at 8 o'clock in the morning, right? Uh, I hope this, by the way, that intro clarifies the question that the person in the back asked as I was coming in. No, I am not the Mater D. Um, as Yossi suggested, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about aging, but not just about aging. I want you to think about the older consumer, and by the way, we'll talk about what old is in a, in a little bit, but really, as you think about the supply chain and innovation, we tend to think in terms of systems, but we tend to think within systems that we manage ourselves. So where your part of the world is and getting it to the next person and the like. I want you to think about aging or the older consumer as that endpoint. We are now seeing, if you will, the emergence of a new alpha consumer. So as we go through today, I want you to start thinking about how not just technologies, what is the uh, phrase that Clay Christensen at uh, Harvard, that's the school, uh, the art school up the river from us at MIT, um, called disruptive technologies. The, the notion that there are some technologies that come out of nowhere and, and disrupt your business, uh, much the way the, shall we say, the mainframe industry was surprised by the fact that actually people would want a personal computer on their desk, uh, despite many people saying, ah, 200,000 a year tops in terms of the market. I'd like you to think in terms of disruptive demographics. What are the two things, by the way, class participation today is 10%. Um, disruptive demographics, what are the two things we'd like to say in the United States are, you can bet on? Death and taxes, that's right. Well, it appears that taxes, yes, death, not so much. Um, can you imagine the following? That the funeral home industry, it's one of my favorite cartoons from Fortune magazine, was lamenting that frankly, you are not dying fast enough. Imagine this, that the boomers are living and their parents are living so much longer, frankly, they weren't making plan. So here's the question. If one of the businesses that you can actually depend on is actually having problem, what is the disruptive demographics of an aging society, the expectations that go along with that, and some other things that we'll find out about that population. How is that going to change your business, your customers, and your customer's customer along the end? So think about this. One baby boomer turned 61 this year. In fact, you may have seen USA Today last week. The first baby boomer started collecting Social Security. The baby boomers are now turning 61 one every seven seconds. You know what that is? That's a nation of Floridas, essentially. So next time when you're driving around, be careful one way or the other. But I guess look at that photograph. Do you think that the boomers are going to age with the same expectations and the same attitude as their parents? How is that going to ripple in terms of the products, the service, and indeed even the politics that they're going to demand in the future? So here's the question. How is this disruptive demographic going to affect an aging society the consumer marketplace, and I know this is light years out for those of us who you know, came from industry or now in academia and the like, but to think in terms of five years out and 10 years out. So you know, there's good news and bad news in this, that frankly, as the cartoon would indicate, you've got a long time to live. Do you know that the fastest growing part of the population now is over age 85? That's not just in the United States, but that's largely around the world. That the year 1900 life expectancy was about 47, Today, life expectancy is easily 78, 79, but frankly, we're seeing so many more people live longer than that, that 85 plus is the fastest growing, and beyond that, 100 plus is the next fastest growing population. Do you know that there's a town in Florida, uh, and I'll just give this to you as a public safety announcement. In Destin, Florida, there are 14 drivers with licenses over the age of 100, and they do drive. So here's a quick overview. Let's talk about what the demographics are. What is that new face of old age? Because as I said, this is not just about more parents and more grandparents as we know them. But frankly, it's about most of us. And what are the emerging business models? How is business responding to that? How are they leveraging the convergence of consumer expectations and new technologies to actually come up with new ways of delivering value, defining the customer, and developing new product ideas? And then what are the implications for your business and supply chain? So here's the global map. You know, often we think that we're the only ones aging. The fact of the matter is the United States is relatively young. But we are now looking at a world where one in five, or in most places around the world, industrialized world, one in four consumers out there are over age 60. 
Look at Europe, for instance. Europe already today is at 20% of their population being over age 60. And by the way, that 20%, that includes kids 0 to 16, 0 to 18. So we're really left with a serious question about who is going to do the work, who is going to buy the products, whatever it might be. The former Soviet Union, Russia, that's not a success story. That's actually a tragedy. Do you know that life expectancy there has gone from 62 in 1990 to 57 now? Alcohol, AIDS, and traffic accidents are essentially destroying a population. And of course, if you look at Japan and other places around the world, Asia, and like you're seeing an amazing aging population. So let's just look at, so we say, two of our strongest industrial partners today. If you will, a tale of two countries. Germany, with their own numbers, are looking at the fact that today, with roughly 80 million people, they are likely to decrease over the next 25, certainly by 50 years, to 50 million people. They actually had a headline story in the paper when I was in Munich a few months ago, where they were celebrating that the birth rate, for the first time in years, has actually been in the positive. Do you know what they counted? 600 babies net that year. We're talking about populations just going away. Japan, even more starkly, may lose 50% of its population, going from 125 million people to 60-some million people, where maybe 25 to 30% of who's left will be over 65. Who are your partners? Where are you doing your man manufacturing? Who's going to be buying? Who's going to be developing the innovations that you'll be moving and selling tomorrow? China, well, the answer is, we'll outsource. Well, this is getting a little further down the road. But you know, China had the one child, one family policy enacted in the 1980s. It was so successful, guess what? They were having a geriatric explosion. We already have 140 million people today over age 60 in China. And over the next coming years, think of this, a country larger, 100 million more than the United States' total population today will be inside China over the age of 60. And by the way, it's not just older adults. That's also, and we'll find this as a trend elsewhere, that's where the money is in China. That's where the overseas investment is coming from. In fact, Goldman Sachs issued an alert saying that in the future they could see a workforce shortage in China. These are truly disruptive times being driven by disruptive demographics in the United States and around the world. Now, this is where you get the, shall we say, uh, seventh inning stretch. This is the classic, what we like to call, pig and the python. This is about the baby boomers. The baby boomers are those of us born between 1946 and 1964. So let's do a little test here. For those of you born before 1946, please raise your hands. OK, get ready for the vibration. For those of you born between 1946 and 64, please raise your hands. Now, those of you born after 1964, raise your hands. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not just this group. That is the demographic profile of the industrialized world today. So the folks in before 1946 would wish the baby boomers would just stop their whining, and the folks after 1964 would wish we would just go away. The bottom line is, we're not going anywhere anytime soon, and as you'll see, according to both your sales and your workforce and the like, you're going to have to hold on to us old folks for as long as possible. But what this chart shows you is that pig, those of us that raised our hands, where the pigs moving through that python, if you will, squaring the pyramid. Essentially what we're looking at now is what used to be a normal demographic profile where few people at the top that are older and lots of young kids at the bottom. We're now seeing a squaring where old is something that's here permanently. So if, for those of you doing business in the United States, the darker the color in the state, the greater the percentage of older adults in that state. Don't be fooled. In California, there are more older adults there than any other state in the country. But in terms of actual concentration, look at where the traditional manufacturing, transportation, and other resource states are, agriculture and the like, and you'll find those are the oldest states that we have. And finally, the last demographic chart at this hour of the morning, but it's really the only one you need to remember. The fastest growing part of the population, as I said, is 85 plus. Then you see that wave of the boomers, that big peak. But ladies and gentlemen, this is what you need to think about in terms of fundamental disruptive demographics. You have no choice but to pay attention to the next generation older consumer. There is a drop in the population afterwards. That is a workforce issue, that is a market force issue. So that means in terms of where your workers are coming from and where your customers are coming from, you're going to have to wait a good 10 years before there's a next bump of our children coming along the line to be our next generation customer and worker. So how are businesses taking you know, a look at that and addressing that issue? 
Um, think about this. Schwinn Bicycle has announced not too long ago that they are terrified of an age-induced recession. As you can tell by looking at me and certainly many of you, we don't ride bikes much anymore. Not only that, there are not that many kids out there to buy bicycles. So they're having, a, shall we say, a hard time moving that product. Anheuser-Busch, I'm sure many of you out there are familiar or work or have imbibed in the product. But years ago, they started to see a drop in their share. Many would say, well, it's because people were going to microbreweries, in part. But no, the boomers changed their tastes. They were going for energy drinks, health drinks, liquor, wine, and spirits. So what Anheuser-Busch has been finding is that their supply chain has now become strategic advantage not to deliver just their product, but to reinvent themselves in delivering other products that an aging chronic disease uh, generation is in need of. Now, by the way, there's a picture up there of Willie Nelson. I was born in 1961. I think he looked that way when I was born. I'm not sure he's changed. But, but even The Gap has now tried for a number of years to come up with a cross-generational strategy. So whether it's developing a store that is geared mostly for the 40-plus woman, or the idea of a cross-generations with images such as Willie Nelson and, and Laura Hutton trying to get into that area. When was the last time some of you went to buy music? Now, many would argue that the music industry is seeing less sales in CDs because kids, and this is the technical term, are ripping it off the web. At least we hope they're paying and then ripping it on the web. Um, that's only part of it. But the fact of the matter is, I want you to pay attention. Next time you go into Borders or Barnes & Noble or the music store of your choice, you walk in, and to the right you'll see Aerosmith, and to your left you'll see Mel Torme. By the way, both are geriatric. The fact of the matter is, is that the stuff that the kids buy is in the back because the kids aren't in the store. Not only because they're getting it off the web, but they're not there to show up. They're selling to you. But the new premium customer, imagine this, the lifestyle leader of today and for the foreseeable future is well over 50. Nissan, BMW, Cadillac, any premium car product you think about, today the average age is at least 54, if not as high as 62. Do you know that the largest buyers of flat screen TVs are not the kids over in their 20s and 30s, but largely in the area of about 55 years old? So as we start thinking about the over 50 market, these are the folks that are going to be demanding premium service, premium product, and personalized de delivery. So here's my assumptions going in. One, it's not about their age and it's not about their numbers, but rather it is the boomers' expectation that are changing how we define markets, design services and deliver value. Technology is offering new exciting ways to open up new distribution channels to reach this population. And probably the most fun and exciting thing is that innovative business models are actually blurring the line between products and services. I'll show you today how companies such as Panasonic have basically decided that there are certain parts of their business that are just pure commodity and they have to get into the services business to survive, let alone to make money. And then lastly, Imagine this, 100 million people in the United States today, one third our population is over age 45. That is the core of your consumers and your workforce. And by the way, is the new strategic target for every business that is out there. So let's meet the new but older and disruptive demographic. As I said, it's not just about birthdays. One, the new face of that older consumer is, and there's going to be a theme here, guys, I'm sorry to tell you this, I'll give you a warning up front. She is older, relatively healthier, better informed, and we can talk about what that means later, more technology savvy, wealthier, distinctly female. Aging, we'll find by the end of this presentation, you will know is a female sport. And lastly, providing caregiving, kids and parents and probably guys in between. Well, let's talk about health. All of us, and by the way, I saw the way you guys were wolfing down the donuts, and right after this talk, I'm going to have scrapple and eggs across the street. We may be improved health, but we're going to be sick for a very long time. As we age, one of the things that we're seeing in the population is, yeah, we're living longer. However, we're seeing more and more illness. And what I mean by illness is chronic disease. Do you know that 110 million Americans have at least one chronic disease? That means hypertension, asthma, diabetes. 60 million of us pulled the lottery ticket to have two chronic diseases. 20 million of us have five chronic diseases. That's the bad news. The good news is that we're pushing what we call comorbidity, that is disease or the feeling of being sick, further and further out in our, our lifestyle. So here's the difference. The challenge we now have is I may be ill, 
but how can you help me in the workplace or any place manage my sickness so that I'm productive, I'm not absent, and frankly, I can do those things that I want. Later this afternoon in our, our session, we'll be talking about how wellness is affecting the workplace. And Dexter Sherney in that session will be talking specifically about how wellness is actually being looked at as a strategic advantage, not just as a way of saving insurance costs. So here's a question that gets personal very fast. What is old? Anyone want to throw out a number? 75? You know, usually that answer comes back, and it's usually 20 years older than the respondent. So that means even to a 75-year-old, we're looking at more. No, I'm going to give you a painful answer, and given the fact that I'm 46, it's very painful. We peg in the age lab aging, believe it or not, at this strange number of 43, but I'll call it 45. Now, that may be very uh, disheartening for many of you this morning. But the reason why we look at 45 is a couple of reasons. One, you're now at still, you're basically entering the peak of your economic power to be able to do something about your future. Two, that Thanksgiving dinner you had last year, you sat down with your parents, somehow suddenly dad got older. Aging is now on your agenda, if you will. You're starting to look at how your parents are aging and what they're expecting and with how they're living. You're saying, you know, there's something I need to think about. And then third, as this chart will indicate, this is health care costs over time. Well, I have to confess, I grew up here in Philadelphia. And you know what that means? That means as a basic food group, there are three. Scrapple, cheesesteaks, and tasty cakes. By about 45, chronic disease starts to take off, and my insurance plan starts paying for it accordingly. So let's talk about education. Now, years of school do not necessarily dictate intelligence, but they certainly dictate the ability to access information. 90% of boomers have finished high school, and we've doubled the number of people in college that have gone to college in this generation. The little uh, graphic you see up there, do you know that the fastest growing portion of new students entering major schools like Boston University and the like are not the traditional 18-year-old kid? but people over age 50. And by the way, I'm not talking about going back to school to take art history, the class that if you took it as a kid, your parents would have canceled your tuition. I'm talking about the classes that they actually want to go and get a degree. That means going back and becoming a new professional in computer science or education or something like that. We have countless examples and data points where engineers, say, from companies like Raytheon are retiring at 55 saying, I want to retire, but I want to do something differently. I think I'll be a high school teacher. How do I do that? And by the way, in terms of education and use of technology, women in particular are the fastest growing segment on the web over age 50, seeking health information, finance, and as of about two months ago, and are now leading automobile purchases as well. Smart income. Now, there's a, no, there's a lot of discussion out there about whether the boomers will have enough money to retire and the like. The fact of the matter is they have more money than any previous generation. And despite the fact my father told me he was actively and eagerly spending my inheritance, they're going to earn their money the old-fashioned way. They're going to inherit it. Lester Thoreau, an economist on, at MIT, has noted that there probably is about to be a transition of wealth of anywhere from 10 to $14 trillion from the World War II generation to the boomers. But don't get excited yet. It's not about the money they have. Has anyone paid attention not to Costco inside, but Costco in the parking lot? If you look at the demographics of people who shop at Costco and Target, there's a new value in the baby boomer population. They expect more, pay less to borrow from Target. And that is, if you go into Costco, you'll notice that you'll see all these folks buying brand name products, if you will, at a reasonable price and then slipping outside into their Porsches, BMW, SUVs, and running away kind of like this. I got it cheap, I got it free. Or I got a big discount. The idea here is, is that they may have cash, but they want to spend it smartly. Saving money is not about the economics. It's what it says about me. I'm smart. I was able to get a good buy. So as we start thinking about the income, the idea is not just that there's money there, but largely how it wants to be spent. Well, guys, this is basically where I, I would uh, turn around and uh, go and have an extra donut. Uh, it gets uh, pretty dour from here. Women now are more educated than men in all degree fields but engineering. They have the highest workforce participation in history now, or at least full-time or at least part-time, 70% of the workforce. Uh, and by the way, guys, given what we're eating, there's no, reason, there's no wonder why they live 7 to 11 years longer. They are the primary caregiver. That is, they are not only caring for her parents, probably your parents as well, and certainly the kids in between, the so-called sandwich generation. But here's the data that makes companies like Johnson & Johnson, Best Buy, automobile companies really take notice. 
they control 80 cents to 90 cents on the dollar of every consumer purchase out there. So when you want to say, where's my supply chain going? It's going to her. If you understand a 45 plus year old female and older, you understand what your supply chain is supposed to be aimed at. I want you to think of her as the family CEO. She's not looking for products. She's not looking for services. She's looking for total solutions and everything from entertainment to healthcare to home improvements and the like. Speaking of home improvements, even Home Depot and Lowe's and the like, who traditionally built their business, if you will, around guys who wear belts and tools, have now found that 80% of the decisions for home improvement are being driven by the wife. Here's a little geriatric or gerontology lesson for you. As you see the cartoon there, we, we, we classically see retirement where uh, presumably the husband retires and he comes home and says, let's you know, travel, see grandchildren, let's do lots of things. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the way it actually happens. Men as they age, let's just pick a, a fictitious, men as they age tend to retire on a Friday. And by the way, if they don't have a heart attack in the first six months, they're doing well because that's when most heart attacks occur because they're leaving their purpose, their social network, and everything else at the job site on Friday. Come home on Monday, and let's say you, you do pretty well. Come home on Monday, where's dad? By the way, how many of you golf? Okay, there's a few of you. Unfortunately, guys, I agree with Mark Twain. It's a good walk ruined. Um, let's say dad Monday is, where's dad? Dad's on the golf course. Where's dad? Dad is now in the garage. Where's dad? Dad's puttering. By the way, no one knows what puttering means, but we say it anyway. Puttering in the basement. Where's dad? Dad's on the couch. As men age, they circle in. Let's talk about men, uh, women now. Where's mom? Mom is volunteering. Where's mom? She's with the grandchildren. Gee, where's mom? She actually is part-time work. One of the things you have to look at more recently with baby boomer women and even their mothers, where's mom? She just started her own company. Do you know the fastest growing entrepreneurial set out there is not the 20 year old kid with a software idea. It's now women going back to work in small businesses and starting their own. So bottom line guys, lay off the donuts because basically she's got an edge on you already. So let's talk about what she and many others are doing. Do you know that one in four families in business today are caring for families with an older adult? 12 to 18 hours a week of everything from checking to see whether dad's gotten his blood pressure checked or has made a, uh, a trip to the uh, barber shop, whatever it might be, it begins with that social contact. Hi, how are you? It also then the next one is issues management. An appliance is broken. How do I get that fixed? Yeah, calling the adult child, the adult daughter typically then financial planning. And if you look at this as a level of effort over time, it only stacks up. Food shopping, health care, and the like. More than 50% of workers in Fortune 500 companies are now looking at elder care as a larger issue than daycare ever was in the workplace. So that means when you start looking at your workforce in terms of absenteeism, presenteeism, this has become a major strategic issue for most employers around the country and indeed the world. So, what, what, are we, what are we looking at with the aging of the population? What is the difference? Well, we're looking at great expectations. I would suggest to you that the biggest difference between our parents and the baby boom generation is we've had more, we've experienced more, we expect more in old age. So whether it's the, as you see the graphic there, it says living longer, living better. By the way, guys, it's all about her, it's not about him. Or frankly, even if you look at Vogue magazine, believe it or not, Vogue magazine does an age issue and has done such for the past 12 years. And it's a fun magazine to look at, no wise jokes, fun magazine to look at in terms of how we define aging socially over time. And do you know that when it started the age issue, it went from 16 to 36. The most recent one now is now looking at 20-something to 93, with the promise and indeed the vision of Pearls and Levi's at age 90. If you ask the population what they anticipate doing, they expect to be learning and traveling, volunteer activities, at least part-time work, no serious limitations on their activity well after 70, and frankly, even for those that are over 80, at least half of us believe we're going to be going strong. So with that kind of expectation, we're going to be looking for solutions or things that are going to make it possible, if you will, for us to do that. Enter technology. Technology has been the silver bullet in many cases to allow us to live longer. Now the question is, how can companies and governments and the like use technology to help us live better? 
Well, the first one, to borrow from Motorola, is the notion of intelligence everywhere. Ubiquitous computing, sensors, uh, whether it's in the house, whether it's in the car, uh, the use of, creative use of RFID and the like to be able to detect where mom is in the house, is she fine, did she take her medication, whatever it might be. Wearable computing, how are you actually doing maybe on the work site as well as in your home, heart rate and the like. The shirt that you see up there was developed at Georgia Tech, the smart shirt. Basically, is allow, it enables you to do an EKG, an EEG, pulse rate variation, and track you anywhere on the planet within about five meters of accuracy. Whether you want us to, that's another thing. Uh, the idea of user interface, making it possible so you can actually use these devices. Imagine this, systems you can actually understand. But the real innovation we see is that technology is not so much the new thing, but it's the innovative services that technology enables it to be done. So for instance, interactive health, being able to facilitate a checkup a day in the house. The little spoon you see up there is a, a, a device that was developed at MIT that frankly I think takes a lot of fun out of life. You see, as you're making, in my case, your brownie mix, you're going through and you're making your brownies, it'll tell you the, not only the viscosity of the mix, but it'll also tell you how much fat and sugar is in the content. There are some things you just don't want to know. So let's talk about, let's pause for a moment. Really, trends are interesting and they're fun to look and describe at. You describe. But trends really don't give you terrible insight. So if you look at ARP, they've distilled the aging population to saying that 60 is the new 30. If that's the case, I guess I've just entered puberty. But real strategic insight is how does that change the value, if you will, of the customer? How does it change her needs and what she expects out there? So on that note, what I would like to suggest, these are the characteristics, if you will, of a consumer-driven, boomer-driven innovation marketplace. First is the notion of blur. There are no products and there are no services. To the consumer, there are only solutions. We are now eliminating the line between those two things. I want a job done. I don't care how you get it done, just do it. Secondly, because she is the family CEO, in particular around women, and she's working and providing care and having a full-time job in the household as well, she's looking for organizations that provide aggregation, that is, that give the knowledge and the convenience to be able to manage health, manage food shopping, whatever it might be. And by the way, this is the big one. I know we like to generalize about the baby boom population. I do it myself. But you're talking about nearly 80 million people that fit within that cohort. If there's anything that can be generalized to 80 million people, it's the following. It is the me generation. We are not a, gener we are not a generation. We are not a market segment. We like personalized service. We are instead segments of one. One product will not fit all. Trust. You know, there's a lot of research out there on what the definition of trust means, trusted relationships, trusted collaboration. The most useful definition, I think, comes from engineering, predictability. And that is the notion that you can actually only trust a service or a product or a company based upon a long history, not just on the brand. I mean, think about it. Brand is great, but this is the generation that dropped American cars like hot potatoes and will switch any brand within a heartbeat if it does not deliver. And then lastly, and this is probably one of the things I learned best from looking at ING Direct, the banking company, or Staples, other innovators in this idea, is that easy, keeping it easy. As the baby boomers age, we may have poor vision, we may be slowing down, we may not hear so well. This is getting really cheery, isn't it? But what we're looking for is not things that are necessarily usable or made for an old man or old woman. We want things that are easy and simple. Well, depending on your level of kindness today, what I'd like to show you is four or five visions or hallucinations, if you will, of boomer-driven innovation, if you will, out there that cross the sector. In the Age Lab, we truly believe that innovation never, ever comes by benchmarking your competition, never, ever from looking within a single industry. We think that innovation comes from where the consumer sits, and he or she looks across. So these innovations I want to look at, how health, consumer electronics, the automobile, even the home, we're seeing innovations that are being driven by that consumer and how that might actually change your business. So let's first talk about retail services. Um, for those of you from the UK, you're very familiar with Boots, but for those of us who are from the United States or elsewhere, Boots is how you pronounce CVS or Walgreens in, in English, I guess is the way to best put it. Boots is now finding that much of their f uh, financial success has not been from moving toilet paper and toothpaste and medication, but rather from bringing services into the store. And I don't mean flu shots, I'm talking about foot care, diabetic care, and the like. 
So if you look at what CVS did not too long ago, ago by buying Minute Clinic, or Target by having Minute Clinic in their stores, the idea of actually providing healthcare, a dock in a box, if you will, in the store to not just drive foot traffic, but to make it convenient 24-7, in many cases, access to medical care, which, by the way, would then drive where the highest percentage of gross of profit, rather, is in stores like Target and CVS and the like, and that is in health and beauty. So the idea that we had is looking at how services are coming into the store as a driver of not just sales, but also of consumer dependency. We had one student that did a thesis, for our MLOG thesis, that surveyed a number of CEOs for pharmacy and drugstore chains. And one of the quotes that came back is that he saw more profit, not necessarily sales, but profit coming from services more than anything else. The kiosk that you see in that graphic is being operated by Governor Kempthorne of Idaho. And Governor Kempthorne at the time, what we were looking at is how to bring health care into the drugstore, into the workplace, or anywhere else where you can take your blood pressure, diabetes, check, weight, all the things you can do now with kiosks that are in many other stores. The difference is with this you can pick up the phone in real time and be connected with a doctor. Retail services. How many, what would you say is the greatest motivator of uh, humankind? Anyone take a guess? I heard money. Well, we actually think it's guilt. You see, if you look at the device that the woman is holding up there, that's one of our pill pets or what we call farm animals. And what the pill pet does is it reminds you to take your meds. And it reminds you to take your meds much like the Tamagotchi toys years ago, the Japanese toys that if you didn't take care of them, they got sicker, sicker, and died. This uses guilt. And essentially, it has a picture of your grandchild on it. And it, allows, it reminds you to take your meds. And if you don't take your meds, it gets sicker, sicker. And by the way, your grandchild's picture fades and dies. And the only way to bring this pet back is to bring it either back to the doctor's office or to the pharmacy where you, you got it. And the idea is to create a social network based upon emotion to actually do the things that we rationally know we should do, but we don't. The next generation, by the way, of these so-called farm animals, P-H-A-R-M, is our two bunnies. And the bunnies will have a little uh, glowing LCD in their, their tummy. And the grandchild will get one. The grandparent will get another. And the grandchild has to promise to do their homework. The grandparent has to promise to take their meds, exercise, and whatever it might be. It will be connected by radio frequency technology, pager technology, so you could live in Massachusetts, your grandchild could be in California. And what it does is if either one of you fails on your social contract, the bunny gets sick, sicker, and if you fail altogether, the opposite person's bunny dies. And so the idea is to create that emotion connect. Now, talk about bringing the supply chain, if you will, home. One of the things that we were looking at some time ago was RFID. And so in collaboration with Procter & Gamble, we were looking at RFID not in the classic sense that you have in terms of how it improves efficiency in the supply chain, but frankly, from a very selfish consumer perspective. What's it do for me? What's that information that is so valuable to you going to do for me, the end consumer? Well, with all the folks out there with chronic disease, many of them are managing diet and the like, what would happen if you could take the 20 to 40 or the average 40,000, 50,000 SKUs found in the grocery store and put the ingredients on a database and enable you to take your personalized diet and in real time, at the point of decision, shop in the aisle? So we develop what you see there in the shopping cart as the personal smart advisor. And it does just that. We take a smart card, your doctor puts your diet, your personalized diet on the smart card, swipe it into the cart, go through the aisle, and for now using barcode, eventually when the penny chip is actually a penny, swipe uh, the RFID tag underneath there. And in my case, it'll say, gee, Joe, you chose your parents really badly, you're pre-hypertensive, put the Ritz crackers back, try townhouse crackers or something like that. Lower sodium, lower fat, whatever it might be. Now, let's talk about the last part of retail services. I like to call this the ultimate layaway plan. There is a funeral concierge company that actually has developed an insurance policy as well as a planning tool to help you plan your or anyone else's funeral. It's not done at the funeral home. It's not done by your favorite insurance salesman. It's found at Sears. Not Sears here in the United States yet, but Sears Canada. And the idea is that Sears Canada, for instance, has the largest book of business around the 50 plus. They have their own credit card for the, that age group. They have their own magazine. And essentially what they're doing now is using the store as a place to take care of life planning, and in this case, shall we say, end of life planning. Personalization. As I said about the boomers before, it's not about how long or how big our generation is. It's really 
what it is we want. And so Nike, a number of years ago, started developing the idea of customized running shoes. Now, this may be an age issue for my part. Does anyone know the difference between sneakers and running shoes? Yeah, it's about 50 to 80 bucks is generally the difference. So what Nike has done and many others have done is they're being able to go online and customize based upon whether you pronate, you have bad knees, whatever it might be. But the idea is to create a shoe that is not just a personal fit, but a personalized experience. As, and as it was said by the Nike representative at this part, the baby boomers are now entering not just chronic disease prime time, but they now have the middle age aches, pains of middle age aches and pains that go with their age. But they also have the disposable income to take care of them. Let's talk about up close and personal. You know, boomers have had higher expectation for personal service and products more than anyone else. Even the automobile, where we like to choose the color and the seats and the like, what we're finding, and with uh, some work we've been doing with Volkswagen in particular, is that we're having to find that cars, the second largest purchase you have in your home, being pushed, the final assembly, getting pushed closer and closer to the consumer. Do you know that the Jetta has 146,000 different configurations? And the idea is that how to have those configurations, not just it's coming, it's coming, it's on the dock, it'll get here, but how fast can the product get here, but then how can you personalize it in the dealer's uh, uh, garage or nearby? So the idea that the consumer wants to pick and choose, but they want it immediately. That sounds probably more like the boomers than anything else. Now, we're working on a car at MIT called the Driver Aware Car, which we're looking at as a $1 million test vehicle that does a number of things. But instead of just being able to personalize your colors and your, your lighting and the like, this car is actually going to personalize its ride to how you're feeling. You see, this car actually does physiological measurement behind the wheel to detect whether you're excited, stressed, angry, or whatever it might be. And as you can see there on the heads-up display, the windshield will actually start to display blood pressure pulse rate and the like, and if that doesn't get you too nervous, the car itself will start to do things to lower your stress level. So the idea now is that we're finding is that the boomers, particularly boomer women who buy a Volvo, are looking for their car to be as much a transportation device as much as a spa. And so looking at the idea of getting in the car and leaving, coming out better than you were when you got in. Intelligent home services. How many of you have been to Japan? Okay, how many of you have been on a smart toilet? How many of you have been accosted by a smart toilet? <laughs> now, for those of you who have not had the joy, if you will, of being uh, on a smart toilet, and I know it's close to breakfast, uh, so we'll try to keep this in the most technical terms, Panasonic, Toto, and others have developed a smart toilet many years ago. They started out at about $2,000 a potty, and now they're down under $1,000. And essentially what this toilet does is this internet-enabled commode. It has sensors on it to weigh you, to detect glucose, and it's safe to say it downloads this information um, from the usual source. But then the unfortunate phrase we have to think about, it then uploads these data to call centers. So one of the things we're starting to see in Japan and elsewhere are smart toilets, if you will, that are connected to call centers at hospitals, call centers at disease management clinics and the like. Well, it seems that the British have now entered the toilet wars. The toilet you see on the screen there is the VIP toilet. And there was a pilot program being tested in the UK now to take that same toilet that's been used in Japan and even selected parts of the United States to download and upload all those data. The difference is the following. It also detects your diet and your fiber in your diet and then connects you, and maybe some of you are here, connects you to Tesco to facilitate, shall we say, the home delivery that your toilet has now dictated that uh, <clears throat> apparently you need. Now, why is Bill Gates on my screen next to the smart toilet? What I'd suggest to you is that the home hub of the future that's going to coordinate lots of communication around what's in my cabinet, what's in my toilet, what's on TV, everything else, is not going to be this new device but largely it's going to be the PS2, the PlayStation, the, uh, the, the different devices that Sony and Xbox from Microsoft are putting out there. It is a device that's already in your house because of your kids or your grandchildren, and it's got uniform protocols. It's going to enable your refrigerator to talk to your cabinet, your cabinet to talk to your car, your car to go to the grocery store with a virtual shopping list and the like. So let's talk about what those services are already looking like today. This is not science fiction born out of Cambridge. Now that's a teddy bear, my daughter and I have an ongoing argument, teddy bear, tiger, whatever it is. It takes your blood pressure, it has a motion sensor in it, 
and you can plug it into the wall using the bandwidth of the electrical outlet to be able to upload that information to a hospital or any call center you want to connect to. How much do you think it costs? It's made by Panasonic. 200? No, it's a little better than that. It's free. Well, it's free the way your cell phone's free. Think about this, Panasonic in Japan teamed up with Tokyo Electric Power realizing that the day that you make a device, one hour after that, you've made a commodity. So what they're now doing is they're giving away these devices through the electrical company, because because the electrical company is providing the electrical conduit to collect the data from the bear or the tiger, what it happens now is that healthcare and wellness services are being billed through the electrical service, the, the utility, and they're billing in and giving away the device for free to provide that service, connecting 60,000 homes in metropolitan Tokyo uh, to University of Tokyo Hospital to manage uh, congestive heart failure. Now, one could argue that you know, the Japanese, they, they, they're uh, more cutting edge on technology, their toys and the like. Let's look at a, a product that was just developed not too long ago, but was tested here in Philadelphia. It's a strategic relationship between Philips and Comcast. The product is called Motiva. And it takes your television and allows you to do everything that little bear did, that is upload the information when glucose, blood pressure, the like, to your cable box, send it to your doctor's office or to whatever the call center is, but then give you a pri an encrypted private channel on your TV that shows you when you took your meds, if you didn't take, scheduled conferences uh, or scheduled meetings with your doctor, your nurse, and the next generation video conference as well. And with Comcast, aggregate channel bandwidth around services and shows that you may be interested in, exercise, cooking, whatever it might be, essentially your private health station. So intelligent home services, we think the house of the future is not some gee whiz whiz bang house that you're going to be building way in the future and hopefully retire to. Our argument is that by the time you're 50, 92% of us, our marriage, our mortgage, and our memories are where you are living at that point. You're, you're probably going to stay there. In fact, by the way, for those folks who do move to Arizona, Florida, the like, which is only about 9% of the population, they move, but the second that a spouse gets sick or unfortunately passes away, they ricochet back, by the way, typically again to the oldest adult daughter. So what does that intelligent house of the future look like? It is sensor smart. Your toaster is now far more intelligent than it ever was. LG refrigerators connected to the, the internet. Your clothing is getting more intelligent with smart sensors and like even your entertainment systems, and we know from before that your toilets are talking about you. All that information going into a data management center, then connecting you, and this tends to be geared towards health, but could be any number of services, connecting you to doctors, emergency services, health monitoring, uh, the grocery store. So that's, that's conceptually what it might look like, but let's put some faces and names to that. And all of a sudden you start realizing it becomes very real of what could be. You know, Procter & Gamble has more interest than even the person who does the shopping in the house to know when you're out of toilet paper and toothpaste. Walmart has an even greater interest to know when you might be coming for it or when they might be able to facilitate delivery in the future. The people who would own that conduit to the house may be the cable TV company, the electrical utility. And I would suggest that the management of those data, that privacy and the related information, is probably going to be by a disease management company or like a Healthways or a retail bank. And by the way, retail banks have the highest trust rating of any organization in the United States after the US military. So being able to trust them with information is something we could see happening. Partners Healthcare or Mass General Hospital is already providing second opinions in all 50 states and 35 countries on the telephone, online. ADT, the folks who do help by phone can get up. Philips with a check, uh, check up a day hardware in the, uh, for medical assistance. Stop and Shop or any grocery store that's interested in home delivery. Walgreens, as many of you may have seen, and certainly Walgreens I'm sure is here, has developed Walgreens Health Initiative that is doing home delivery around specific disease categories, whether it's congestive heart failure, diabetes, whatever it might be. And I would suggest that not only can that go on with other services, but probably more importantly be wired together with an affinity group like AARP, maybe even American Express. Well, I've talked about markets. Let's talk about the flip side, workforce. Years ago, Peter Drucker, the old sage on business strategy, noted something I think a lot of people thought was quite scary, but it's coming to pass. That we know that over the next 25 years, working people are going to have to work until they're 70 or in their 70s. It's just a fact, either due to income, due to desire, social connectivity. So how does that workforce going to look and how are we going to manage it? 
we have a graying workforce. Particularly those of you that are, in, that are familiar with the trucking industry, we know that already today we have 20,000 short of truckers, and in the next seven to 10 years, we're looking at probably well over 100,000 uh, truckers that we'll be needing, but we won't have. And because we have fewer younger people, it's really meaning that we're gonna have to keep older drivers in place. For those of you that flew to Philadelphia and plan on flying back, you may be happy to know that 50% of the air traffic control workforce is about to retire. In the next 10 years, they won't be there, so I'd take your earliest flight out while you still can. Older workers, we tend to think about older workers as either being expensive or being a health cost. We have some good news and bad news on this. Older workers are remarkably healthy. Do you know they report less absenteeism and less presenteeism than younger workers? They are one third less likely to get hurt on the job. That's the good news. The bad news is because of the chronic diseases that they are likely to be facing, they are also more likely, if you will, to have a problem returning to work so that they're likely to be out two to three times longer than their younger colleagues when they're out, out sick. What this means is we're gonna have to come up with creative ways to redesign the job and physically redesign the workforce. So for instance, do you know that by the, your late 30s you've lost about 20% of your night vision? By your late 40s you need 20 times more light to be able to see as clearly as you did at age 20. But the real thing we may be losing is lost knowledge. That early out package that people are getting at 50, 55, is something that some people in the company are looking forward to to reduce costs. But those folks that leave at 50 and 55 are also taking the institutional knowledge of what that company is all about. So my colleague in the lab, Dave DeLong, wrote a book called Lost Knowledge and really noted that particularly in knowledge-based industries like healthcare, aerospace, and the like, these folks are retiring, and frankly, we no longer know what we once knew. So one of the things that we are starting to see out there are companies such as Eli Lilly, Boeing, P&G, and other very knowledge-heavy industries are trying to create organizations outside of their companies to be able to access that pool of expertise. Your Encore, for instance, is a company that actually recruits former scientists, former technicians, and the like to be able to contract back into those companies to not only work part-time, but to consult that expertise. Do you know in the UK, Barclays Bank is now finding its fastest growing share of business is on entrepreneurism, but entrepreneurism for people after age 50 starting their own company, they're not calling it Gen X, Gen Y, or Boomer, they're calling it Gen E, the new entrepreneurial class. And lastly, I'd like you to think about the fact that I think that the future, and this is just a, a hypothesis I'm gonna look at more in the future, is much smaller. Has anyone been to the grocery store lately and paid attention to the grocery carts? Do you remember years ago we had lots of carts that had the room for two or three kids and they, the, the ones that looked like little cop cars and some like fire, uh, fire engines? And then we had the big carriages for the super-sized packages of tuna fish that were about this size. Well, we've gone from that down to the normal size, but if you talk to the shopping cart industry, the fastest selling cart now is the little cart you see there, the so-called express or utility cart. Why is that happening? Disruptive demographics is not just about age, it's about fundamental changes in our homes. We now have the empty nesters. Kids are gone to college or just gone. There are families out there with no children at all, and the fastest growing segment of the population are single individual, not single family, single individual households out there. And then frankly, as we age, we eat less. If we're living by ourselves, we need less. And so the idea of being able to carry heavy things and going back frequently or buying family-sized packages doesn't make any sense. So we're seeing the shopping cart, I would argue, is kind of an indicator of something else that's going on. More importantly, I think more strategically, could this be the crack in the future of the big box store and big box retail? Is the huge shopping mall and the huge big box at risk here from people who no longer find it convenient or able to walk several acres to find what they want or find it that it's not so easy to be able to do that shopping? So whether it's the packaging getting small or the retail experience getting small and personalized and perhaps even brought to the house, I think aging and the changing of the household demographic is gonna have a profound change on your demographic. What I'd like to end on is essentially where we began, is that the MIT Center for Transportation Logistics covers the big picture. We provide the strategic view of those things that are gonna define what you do and what you will do in the near future. Aging and disruptive demographics around how old you're getting as well as the customer is getting is only one. 
My colleagues are working on other major initiatives in the coming years ahead. Energy and environment, supply chain 2020, what does that future look like? And don't just wait for it. Supply chain 2020 is about how to engineer and make it happen. And then lastly, healthcare supply chain. With that many boomers out there aging and with healthcare costing what it does, these are major portions of other projects that are going on at the center. I would urge each of you that if you heard something that was interesting to this morning to attend our hot topic session this afternoon at one o'clock. We'll be hearing not just from folks like myself, but folks who are out there in the business, whether it's the Manufacturer Handling Association, CVS, CSX, or our colleagues at Health, Ways, and Disease Management and Wellness. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to end with my twin brother here, who if it is true that one boomer is turning 61 every seven seconds, that roughly 500 of us just turned 61. The question is, can you innovate in boomer time?